A suspicious fire and a white power symbol at a legendary leadership school in the U.S. And a brutal backlash to a women's rights march in Pakistan. This week, we're talking about persisting in the face of violence with the co-executive directors of the Highlander Center in Tennessee and attorney and activist Nigat Dad. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. This fire destroyed one of the main buildings of the Highlander Center in late March, an almost century-old civil rights school in Tennessee that once housed the likes of Rosa Parks and Dr. King. We featured Highlander's newest co-directors on The Laura Flanders Show just days after the midterms. What has happened since, and what do we need to know about the white power symbol that was found spray-painted on the premises at Highlander? Highlander's co-executive directors are back. Ashley Woodard Henderson and Reverend Alan Maxfield Steele are joining us via Skype from Highlander. First off, I want to say we're all just so sorry that you've had to go through what you've been going through. And, and I hate to sort of um, start with what happened. So let's start with where you are now. Like, like how are you doing right now, both of you? Uh, Ash, start. Yeah, I mean, it's been a roller coaster. Um, of emotions, I think both very deep grief because the sacred space has been violated, inspired, um, but also like a lot of joy and a lot of love and a lot of like camaraderie because we have gotten messages and language that I can't read or speak um, from Japan, from the Philippines, from Palestine to Kenya, South Africa, every central Appalachian state, all of the South and almost every state in the United States has sent some love and solidarity with us. So, I think there's been moments of great joy, and I think we've been reminded of the resilience of this place and our people. Hmm. Uh, I, think, I think we feel that like, this is not the first storm that our institution or our people have weathered uh, by any means in our almost century of existence. Um, so it's not only true for our communities, but it's also very true for this particular institution. So t now take us back a little bit. Um, Alan, take us to that morning. It was a Friday morning. Um, what happened? Well, what we learned when we woke up uh, that early that morning was that uh, we were hearing reports of the office being ablaze, engulfed in flames, was some of the language that some of our staff were calling us, telling us about. So folks got together as quickly as possible back on the hill. And by the time that we got there, uh, the blaze was down, but the building was also down to the ground. Um, and then we saw uh, that morning a white power symbol spray painted on the parking lot. Now, tell us a bit about that building. It was a fairly new building. What, what happened in there? And, and what do we know so far about the investigation? Mm -hmm. So new is relative. <laughs> um, so in our almost 87 years, it is one of the newer buildings um, on, our, on our property. And we've been here since about the 70s. Um, and so this building was our main office. It was uh, I've, I've seen people describe it, and it's not untrue that it's kind of the nerve center of, of our staffing. Um, it's where, you know, people built their altars and their offices. It's where I had pictures uh, from, you know, the kids from our children's camp had drawn. It's, it's where we had people's baby pictures and thank you cards. Um, all sorts of stuff was in that office. Uh, we did have an archive room in that in that building. Uh, but it was by no means all of our archives. Um, so we did, the, the press has said a lot that we lost the archives, that's not true. Um, we've also heard a lot about like, why didn't those hillbillies digitize everything? Well, that requires resources that people don't tend to give to people in the South. Um, and so we've been working with outfits all over the country to make sure that our papers are, are safe and, and archived and are in the process of being digitized. And to be honest, because we haven't, been fully cleared to be able to salvage anything from the, what's left of the building. Um, but once we're cleared to be able to, to go in and sort of dig through the rubble, we don't even know what we might be able to salvage because we don't think that everything's been lost. So um, we're just waiting for this ongoing investigation to sort of wrap up and for us to be able to get folks that are historians and archivists and 
anthropologists, et cetera, to come and support us as we try to see what we can get out of that building. So do so talk about that um, investigation. As you pointed out, Alan, this building burnt to the ground. Um, anything suspicious about that? Well, the investigation is ongoing, so there's uh, we know as much as we know, which is that it's ongoing currently. Uh, the most suspicious thing, obviously, was the symbol that we saw spray painted on the ground uh, that seems to mimic a white power symbol uh, that folks can Google and look up. It's one of those things that's out there. Uh, but that's as much as we know right now. But we also know that that symbol wasn't in our parking lot Thursday before the fire. Sorry. Um, we didn't see it until the building was on fire, and that's what makes it suspicious, right? Um, it's also, you know, I think the, the Knox News Sentinel uh, put out a whole article about what they think the symbol is and how they think it's connected to the White Power movement. It's actually not uh, something new. It's just that I think more people are starting to notice um, and be paying attention to the fact that, like, Nazis are marching in Knoxville or burning books in Western North Carolina or shooting up you know, faith spaces, um, et cetera, not only here in the South or in Appalachia, but across the U.S. So we are very, very, very closely monitoring this investigation. Let's take a quick glimpse of some of the history of Highlander. Uh, this is from a, a film made by one of the early participants. Well, between 1960 and 1965, uh, Guy would organize a series of workshops with Highlanders backing to share the repertoire that was growing in the freedom movement. The first one that I got to go to was in 1960. A lot of these young people didn't know it in 1960, but they'd be working for the next 30 or 40 years to bring about a change in this segregated society. Here's your mother. The most primary reason to bring people together was so that people could learn each other's songs and everybody could go home with lots of songs. And it was a way to share around the South a lot of the music. I mean, that just speaks to the longevity. And I want to get back to a sense of outrage about the, the fire. But before we go back there, tell us a bit about the work that you've been doing, you know, up to and including the weekend of the fire and ever since. Um, and the message that I've heard from both of you very strongly over the last few weeks, which is the big news is we're here and we're going strong. I mean, whether it was work to, to nurture a budding labor movement or the work that Guy talks about and Candy talk about in terms of their particular experiences with the, the Black liberation movement that sometimes gets whittled down to the tactic of fighting for civil rights. Um, there's so many different front lines of struggle that Highlander has been connected to over the, the first part, the 20th century work of the institution. And then to talk about what we're doing now is, is one of my greatest joys, um, one of our greatest joys. Um, that we are, you know, involved in helping lead with so many amazing other comrades. The Movement for Black Lives in the 21st century um, is some of the, the most important work I've ever known. And just a little uh, pin on it, I mean, you were, you were doing it that weekend. The morning of the fire, we were getting ready for about 55 to 60 people to come to the hill, we call it the hill, um, here at Highlander, uh, to have a Central Appalachian People's Movement Assembly on prison justice um, for people to literally bring the voices of incarcerated people onto our hill. Um, and we had a decision to make. Our office was literally still smoking. Uh, were we going to cancel this event? We all agreed that like exactly what these folks, if it comes to be that our office was burned down by neo-Nazis, um, that that's exactly what they would want is for us to stop doing our work. They would want us to be so scared that we wouldn't continue the legacy and the work building of, of transforming our communities for the better. And so we decided that we would take our safety very seriously. We would give people the option uh, about whether or not they wanted to still come, but that we would still hold space. And we did. And everyone still showed up. Like not one program has been canceled because of this fire. Um, and it won't be. Uh, we intend to continue the work of, of Highlander Center because movement accompaniment and support work now more than ever in my lifetime is critically important. To, I, not only saving the planet, but saving the people on it too. So I want to end with a bit of a question about the context in which this is all happening. Um, you know, in the immediate uh, wake of your fire, we saw four Louisiana black churches um, set alight. And then, I mean, as I'm talking to you this, uh, talking to you now, I have in front of me the New York Times coverage of the horrendous Notre Dame blaze in, in Paris, which has literally, I think, like, two double spreads on what happened. I mean, an important historic artifact for sure, going back um, centuries, but a little bitty story about what happened in Louisiana. Um, how do you think about 
this kind of compare and contrast and 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 how do we carry the knowledge that you guys are still up against what you're up against in your institution and this work and it still has a hard time kind of surfacing in our in our consciousness one thing that we understand this moment to be is uh, an attack on sacred spaces um, here in the south here in central appalachia uh, this is not a new phenomenon uh, we know that folks who are associated with white power and neo confederate struggles are very interested in attacking and trying to undermine the spiritual uh, and sacred places that whether you're a person of faith or whether you're a person who uh, finds sacredness in coming together to talk about liberation. Um, we know that these places, whether it's here at Highlander, whether it's the, the churches in Louisiana. The mosque in Jerusalem. The mosque in Jerusalem that is not getting a lot of the same coverage uh, as, as Notre Dame. Um, is, are, these, are, these are all places that we have to protect uh, and that we have to think about protection as not only being physical infrastructure that needs to be built or rebuilt, uh, but also holding sacred what is people's places where they can gather, find meaning, uh, share stories, share food, share music with each other. We're one of those places. We send out our love and our camaraderie to our, our, our fam down in Louisiana who are engaging in rebuilding as well. I mean, one of the things I take away from the mass reacting to the to the burning of Notre Dame is, wow, our culture does know how to mourn and grieve. Um, you have the advantage where your institution doesn't even represent the upholding of supremacy and patriarchy and misogyny and, and all the rest. And we're at least trying not to. Uh, and it's a every, every minute of every day kind of commitment to, to building a new world. Um, you know, I think that, that this is a sacred space. Um, that even if you don't believe in some divine power, that if you've ever chanted, I believe that we will win, or ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop, that is a declaration of faith. Um, and people come to this hill and have been coming to this hill since the 70s, have been coming to Highlanders since the 30s, um, because they had that belief that if we could come together, if we could learn together, if we could share each other's stories and skills, uh, then we could build, we could go back home, we could do the work to build the world that we've always deserved where everyone has what they need so that harm doesn't exist anymore. Can people send you money and, and help at this point to help with the rebuilding or the investigation, Alan? We're very happy to receive people's support as we enter into a phase of recovery. Um, so yes, uh, our website, you can go to the donate tab on our website and the general support button that you can, that will already be pushed and you just make sure that that's pushed. Uh, we accept all of those uh, offers and we're grateful for them. We also receive checks, so folks can mail it to our mailing address. We're still receiving mail, still, still, mail. <laughs> still opening it, and sometimes it's bills, so you know we got to pay those too. So we're mailing it out too. Um, but yeah, grateful for folks' support, um, and we're also working very steadily to build infrastructure to where we can, in turn, support other uh, folks in the South who are in need of uh, infrastructure in this particular moment and beyond. Thank you both so much for being with us. Sure. We'll continue this ongoing communication stream uh, going forward. It's a pleasure to talk with you and keep up the great work. Thank, Thank you, Laura. Laura. Thanks. Sure. Pakistani attorney and activist Nigat Dad is the executive director of the Digital Rights Foundation, which strives to educate that country's internet users, particularly women, to protect themselves from cyber harassment. She was recently a co-organizer of the 2019 March 8th Women's March in Lahore. For her efforts, she received a massive backlash, including death threats. But that is not stopping Nigat. She is here in New York to fill us in on the new women and girls rights movement that is emerging in her country. It's not the first, but it is different in interesting ways from what's gone before, and technology is playing a big part in it. Nagat, welcome to the program. Thanks for making a moment to come over and talk with us. Thanks for having um, me. Fill us in a little bit. Why digital rights? Why are digital rights so important in Pakistan? I started working on digital rights uh, back in 2009 when I was actually practicing my law. And uh, lots and lots of women who started using technology, mobile technology wasn't that big, and people who had access to uh, information and communication technologies were mostly men. Uh, uh, so women who were using technology that time, they uh, faced a lot of uh, 
discrimination and backlash in the sense that men were bugging them or sending them unsolicited messages and stalking and harassment. So as a lawyer, one started reaching out to me that do we have any uh, legal remedies around this kind of uh, uh, violation of our privacy? And when I started looking into the laws and policies, I couldn't find any. Mm. And I was like, where, so, you know, like, what, sh what, what should we do? Because this is going to be the space where women are, you know, like exercising their right to free speech, exercising their access to information. And given how Pakistan is in terms of, you know, like a conservative uh, society, not many women has access to uh, public spaces. Mm -hmm. So technology basically gives them the space where they can show solidarity to each other. To uh, It's like an economic empowerment to them as well. What proportion of women have technology, access to technology? Or when we're saying technology, are we talking about cell phones, basically, mobile phones? And, and why is that so, so important? So when we say technology, I meant to say online spaces as well. So mobile phones, but also a social media platform and internet. So Pakistan is a country of more than 200 million people. Uh, and half of the population is, they are, they are women. But we have no data that how many women has access to uh, mobile phone technology or internet. However, uh, we know that mostly people who access online spaces and mobile phones are men. Mm. I mean, I've heard stories of men denying women the right to even have a phone. So, uh, I mean, my personal experience, yeah, uh, when, when I was a law student uh, in 2002, uh, I was going to the university and it was also a time when lots of suicide bombing was ha like were happening in different cities and stuff. Uh, and um, when I asked my family to give me access to mobile phone, because you cannot have it yourself, you have to ask your male guardian. Uh, so your male guardian could be your father, your brother, or your Wait, husband. Can we just back up there for one second? So the, the phone is not accessible to you if you don't have an approval? from your male guardian, if you're a student or if you're anyone? I mean, oh yes, I mean, back then, uh, and you uh, you cannot have it without their permission. Uh, and that was the case with me. So when I asked, I couldn't get permission. So I, I used to go to the university without having any access to the mobile phone, whereas the male family members, uh, my, my family members had access to mobile phone. Things have changed, by the way, a lot, but it's not because it's our right like equal right to access to technology. It's because the security situation where families want that if women are going out or they are going to the universities or colleges or schools or to the works, workplaces, they, they can get in touch with them in case of a security situation. You've made the point, I, I saw a TED talk that you had given where you talked about digital rights are human rights, women's rights, freedom. Um, language that we don't always associate with with our access to, to cell phones. This sort of agenda, or this part of the story, became very visible at these women's rights marches this year. Do you want to talk a bit about how the marches and demonstrations of today and this women's movement of today is different from what went before? Um, so I, I'll talk a little bit about Pakistani context, Go for more. instance, uh, the uh, older movement, the feminist movement in Pakistan back in 1980s in the era of a dictatorship, when they did demonstrations, uh, their uh, way of demonstrations were mostly on the roads uh, and in the public spaces and showing different acts of resistance. And of course, back then there was no technology uh, or if there was, like people didn't have much access to it. But now what I have seen, uh, one thing that we, the, we, we face the criticism from our older uh, feminist movement is that, oh, we came out on roads and we did resistance and our demonstrations ha were more solid than the new generation who are sitting on their couches and doing collectivism. Uh, but now what I have seen is that uh, people who have access to technology, they are making difference in a sense that they are doing activism in the online space. However, I strongly feel that that activism need to be connected with the offline activism as well. And that's something that we have seen in this uh, recent um, Aurat March. Aurat is a Urdu word for women's march. And, uh, and I wasn't expecting as a co-organizer that 
thousands of women will come out on road because that never happened in the history of Pakistan. Even the older feminists who joined the march, they were very, they were pleasantly surprised. And they were like, we are, we are now very optimistic that our future is bright, that lots of women and including men, they came out on road and they were also the people who were using technology, so, uh, online media platforms, and you know, um, they use it every day for their, you know, like activism and feminism. So let's take a look at some of the footage of what happened this March in Lahore. Take a look. Today's rallies is that lots of laws have been passed in favor of women. We went through a very dark period under General Zia where very uh, many anti-women laws were passed. One of them was that if you cannot prove rape, then you will be accused and punished of adultery. So uh, there was an overturn of those laws. However, they have not been implemented. Many pro-women legislation has not been implemented because of the mindset. We had this week a federal minister reprimand Bilawal Bhutto Zardari for using his mother's last name. So obviously standing in parliament, even the policy makers, they need to rethink their approach to women's rights and to uh, what women uh, really stand for in this country. So I think today's rally is saying that recognize the 50% of your population, give us our due rights and change your mindset. Don't think that we are second class citizens. Talk about some of the signs that we couldn't read. What sort of slogans were on there? So uh, there was, you have seen like colorful uh, play cards that women were carrying and lots of them were basically talking about their equal, their right to equal wages, their right to education, right to health. Some of the play cards were uh, very provocative uh, and uh, that's where, you know, like we faced a lot of backlash. Uh, and those play cards basically uh, were talking about a woman's personal agency, their agency over their body, uh, their sexuality rights. And uh, this personal politics have never come out in the public space in Pakistan in the past. Um, and I think that's where when a woman, especially young woman, through those play cards, they basically uh, revealed what they what they feel about their personal spaces so one difference that i uh, i saw in this march and if we look back the past marches or past demonstrations uh, most of the marches are actually against the state brutality mm -hmm. or atrocities or tyranny but this march a lot of young women basically came out in the public space with their personal issues and personal problems and i think that's where the patriarchy uh, just uh, get, you know like got threatened and frightened and that's where we started facing a lot of backlash. And what has that backlash been like? Uh, so it basically started with uh, uh, with some of the play cards uh, going viral on social media. And uh, when it went viral, uh, me mainstream media channels, they picked up those play cards and did uh, TV shows on them and said that this march was actually not on uh, woman empowerment or around the International Women's Day, but actually it's a Western agenda to spread obscenity and immoral immorality and hurting uh, family values in Pakistan. I bet the word homosexuality got used. Usually it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you react? I mean, you've been facing death threats. Uh, I don't want to overstate things. You're here doing your work, but it's real, isn't it? So a uh, lot of women, uh, not just me, but lots of women co-organizers, it, it, we, we not only did a march in Lahore, there, there were marches in Karachi, in Hyderabad, in Peshawar, in Quetta, and all the women organizers, they are out there in the online space do we, because we have been doing a lot of lobbying and advocacy. Uh, so all of them started getting rape threats, death threats. Women marchers who were carrying these play cards, people stalked them, doxed them and found them online and then sent them, uh, you know, these threats. Um, 
But the worst part was that online threats, like as a digital rights activist, I take them very seriously because in closed societies, they have a very strong connection with the offline violence. Um, and the worst part was that uh, some religious clerics, they recorded videos uh, in their, uh, during their Friday sermons in the mosques, and they uh, urged men that if women are saying that they have, they, that it's their bodies and their agency, then you have also agency over your bodies, so go and rape them. And these sermons are still on the social media, on the YouTube. We have reported them. We have gone to the law enforcement. Nothing has happened yet, uh, and which is very disappointing. What do you do next? Uh, we will do the march next year. <laughs> We will definitely uh, do more uh, lobbying with our working class women because we want to be uh, to make it very inclusive. We don't want to make it just like one of March. It, we want to do it as a movement of young women, uh, young feminists who are not only talking about uh, the uh, politics politics around state uh, inequalities or uh, how state treat their citizens, but also about their personal agency. And that's something we really, really need to talk about more. Nigat Dad is the executive director of the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan. I'm glad we've made contact. Let's stay in touch. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can get much more information at our website. That is lauraflanders.org.